so one can go through this. Like we can talk about the two million immigrants who got deported under Obama, right? Uh, it's a massive increase relative to uh, to to George Bush. We could also talk about the fact that uh, virtually coterminous with with him and with Obama announcing the fact that he's going to uh, you know stay the deportations mm -hmm. of up to eight hundred thousand young immigrants, right? Um, he's uh, initiating a major global free trade uh, pact right now, which will in turn force the movements of many people. And we can keep doing this kind of balance sheet. I happen to think that probably Obama might be a little better than Romney. Uh, I, I'm not too sure about that myself because it's really hard to think about it when one thinks about it in terms of war and peace issues, right? And also, in terms of inequality, too, it's, it's a very complex issue. Where does inequality come from? We could have that conversation, and it'll be much more complicated. For example, well, <laughs> just go on and on, but um, I still think that the, the way to get back to a more helpful conversation, right, instead of the emotional pleadings, is to say, well, what are the things that social movements do well, and how can we make sure they do more of that? What are the kinds of things that happen nicely in politics? And how can we make sure more, more good things happen there, right? Uh, the problem that I, I sort of framed at the beginning of the conversation is this. Even where we have robust left-wing parties, right, they seem to plateau somewhere between a third and 50% of the electoral system, right, they tend to vote for them. And that, that has resulted in a stalemate. And we need to figure out how to make a breakthrough. And I think that we've had election cycle after election cycle in the, in the Western democracies where we failed to make that break, breakthrough. So I'm, I'm wondering if there are some other agencies that will allow us to make the breakthrough. For example, so, right, so that, that's the question, right? After Allende was overthrown, the Italian communists went back and wondered, well, what is it we need to do? How do, and this is in a moment where they're, they were seeing themselves and the rest of the world saw themselves at the brink of taking power, right? They thought that Euro-communism would come to pass, right? And, and what they, in their conversations, what they decided is, we need to get somewhere between 66 and 70% of the electorate to vote for us, right? So that we cannot be overthrown. No political party has ever gotten those kinds of percentages, either on the left or the right, in those democracies, right? So, so the question is, how can social movements pull us through to this other side? So I'm, I'm not counterposing getting out the vote versus social movement activity, but what is it that we do well? And one of the things we do well is um, shape the political debate. One of the things that Occupy Wall Street did really well, or the Occupy movement as a whole, was bring the whole question of equality, inequality to the whole population in interesting ways, not the least of which was the fact that a large percentage of them were white middle class people. So white journalists could see other white middle class people talking about the problem of inequality. And that's how it became a bigger social issue. The question is, how can we get these people to be more active? If they were more active, and if this issue was on the agenda right now, I don't think Romney would stand a chance to be elected. So that's where I think the conversation is. Can I quickly respond? Uh, the people coming to me. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Well, Only because he responded to me. So I just don't want to. That's your bitch. No, I mean, I can wait, but I, I, would, I do want to respond. CERN responded to me, so I just feel like I should be able to answer back. Please. Yeah. Um, it, wasn't an, it wasn't simply an emotional comment. She asked me how, she asked the question, a very good question. How would <laughs> it be annoying. better? If, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how would, how, but, but it was a good question. It was the right question. How would the Democrats be better than the Republicans? And I said the difference is 30 million in, uh, the insurance of 30 million people. So there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with emotion if it's backed up with empirical numbers. Because uh, it's a political, it's politics. It's not just ra we're not all like you know uh, abstract uh, rationalists here. We we have feelings, but back it up with numbers. So that's why I respond emotionally. Now, in terms of the point you made, though, I completely agree. And it's, of course, strange to argue with you because, as you know, over the years that I've been here, you've been one of the people I kind of look to for political activist guidance. So um, I agree with you. I think, the th I think we do have a problem now, but I, I, what worries me is there's a, the, so people are starting to imagine the solution lying in abandoning politics and electoral politics, and that's my concern. We shouldn't abandon. I agree we need to figure out new ways, new innovative ways, absolutely. But we shouldn't abandon uh, uh, ways that have had some success in the future, even if they don't lead to revolution, right? 
And even if they don't, they, they still have value. Um, so. uh, yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me over this over the past year of working in Occupy and a variety of other um, offshoot movements, so to speak, is um, I mean, not so much the conversation about whether or not we should be doing more electoral politics or more social movement and how particularly we should go about this, but specifically, um, like, the content of these movements. Like, what do we want to do? What do we want to achieve? And actually having those discussions in a substantive way. And a lot of the discussion about um, social movements versus electoral politics, I think, has sort of taken away from that. And in a way, there's been a lot taken for granted as and in terms of like what we actually agree, like where we want to go and like how we're going to go about that. And like t the discussion about tactics and strategy, I think is a little bit secondary to the idea of like goals and what we actually want to achieve. And so, I mean like what gets emphasized in terms of like issues and things and what we want to focus on changes depending on who you're talking to and where you are and how people understand that is, an, is another thing. I mean. Um, even on a college campus, you can't walk into a situation and um, and and assume that everybody is going to be like student fees are a really bad thing, and I am going to either vote against them or you know protest against them. That's actually not it's sadly not true. You have to make a case to people and actually get them on your side. So I was wondering, um, like, how the how a fo how a stronger focus on content changes this discussion. Well, it's a question for us, guys. <laughs> yeah. Should we take some more of the comments? Yeah, the I mean, I guess. You want to do it that way? I'm, I'm interested to hear what some people have I see a lot of enthusiastic yeah. hands, and I'd love to hear them. OK, all right, and the green shirt. Green rainbow shirt. The green rainbow shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I see uh, Obama the last four years is largely a continuation of the politics of the past. Uh, one of the pieces of literature that's out there is a comparison between Jill Stein, Obama, and Romney. And uh, you know, if we're talking about representing the 99%, uh, if the Democratic Party were to say that, we would laugh at them. Okay, they clearly don't. Uh, you know, you say about uh, what would we, uh, what would we win if Obama is reelected as opposed to Romney? I'll tell you what we've lost the last four years. We've lost a lot of clarity. A lot of people here, a lot of people out there who supported Obama are, are disillusioned, okay? A lot of people here and out there have been censored, self-censored. What, uh, what a McCain presidency would have done the last four years would have been much strongly resisted before the Occupy movement got going than what we have seen. It's like this, when Democrats like Obama get elected, there's censorship and disillusionment. If Obama's elected again, the same thing will happen. So in terms of the direction of the Occupy movement, to the extent that we advocate that Occupy help elect Romney, okay, will add to that increased disillusionment uh, in the future. It's for those people who think that we could reform the Democratic Party, study your history. I mean, I've been an activist for over 40 years, okay? It's like, where is this idea coming from that we could take over the Democratic Party? There's no opposition of the Democratic Party to Obama right now. There is opposition, it's tiny. It's within the Green Party and other left parties that are running small campaigns. Jill Stein's going to be in the ballot in over 40 states, okay? She's very close to getting matching funds. If we support, if we want to support what we believe in, let's stop supporting the existing system. 30 million people, you know, it's like, you know, if finding out the difference between the two parties, take out your microscope. But I want to emphasize what I said. A major thing we lose when the Democrats win is disillusionment, and we censor ourselves. I think that people can debate endlessly whether reform makes sense and whether it helps. You know, the differences between Obama 
and uh, Romney are important or not important or who they're important for and who they're not and people have been arguing about this for like forever. <laughs> and the same discussions take place in Occupy, which I've, I've been involved here in Occupy since September. Um, and I think the, the thing you said, your first point before, I think is the, really the important one. It's the same thing you focused on, that what, a, what Occupy did was raise the issue of inequality in a way that couldn't be ignored. And I think that is the most important thing it can do, and it's the only thing it can do um, without resolving anything else about what its strategy is or what demands it makes. And every time Occupy, every time people in Occupy try to come up with demands, they end up um, the kinds of demands that the liberal wing of the Democratic Party could be pushing, and it means there's no role for Occupy to play in there. Occupy, in my view, doesn't need to become Progressive Democrats of America or MoveOn.org. If, if those groups want to pick up on the inequality issue, and if Occupy making that a public issue gives them more strength to do that, to try to take over the Democratic Party, let them do that. But, and, and if people in Occupy want to do that as individuals, I think that's fine. But I don't think that's what Occupy should be doing, because as soon as Occupy makes electoral change its goal, first we lose the radical energy that it started with, because people will drop out, and then Occupy has to play by the rules of the system. It's the end of direct action. There aren't people running for office who are going to stand up and support illegal direct action. It's not part of the system. And so by becoming enmeshed in the system, Occupy will just um, have no role to play at all. And so my own sense is that we should avoid coming up with demands and avoid coming up with specifics and avoid specific candidates, but generate the issues that we want that system to address. I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of an occupied way of letting everybody get their voice heard, and then we'll talk. <laughs> I, I think a useful way to try to bring together these uh, different concerns is to view the participation in the current electoral system in part as a defensive uh, mechanism. And as a defensive mechanism, you can sometimes justify falling back on saying, well, yes, we, we have to prevent uh, Romney from coming in. That's a defensive move. That, that's not our active uh, preoccupation. Our active preoccupation is a long-term thing and, and should be identified with whatever is necessary to build the movement. Uh, and, and so it, it's true, as, as several people have said, that these concerns can be entertained, can be acted on simultaneously, but, but uh, the, our focus, the focus implied by Occupy, is on the need to uh, transform the system, to have, a, to have a different system. This doesn't translate directly into any kind of uh, choice between the two dominant parties, uh, although it doesn't preclude recognizing at a certain moment uh, that it might make a marginal difference and therefore you'd have to do it. But, I mean, we all know the complexity of the, of the electoral system in this country, but it does leave space in the states where it's very clearly uh, going to go in one direction or another between the two dominant parties to, to um, vote directly for, for, for a different alternative and, and to build for that everywhere because that will have an effect in turn on the way the debate between even the two leading parties takes place. So uh, I'm, I'm a bit um, surprised in, in, a, in, a, in a negative way at, at seeing uh, some of the energy uh, being directed towards a positive uh, support of the Democratic candidacy, uh, rather than just seeing, uh, seeing it as something that might have to be acknowledged as an offensive measure in the context of, the, of prioritizing uh, the task of building a movement. In the, in the back, the stretch. So, you know, in order to have the problem, you know, Seren posed that uh, Syriza might plateau at 30 percent and that the electoral movements may reach a plateau. Well, to even reach that plateau, you have to have a political instrument to work with. So right now, neither the Green Party nor the Obama campaign can possibly offer that. Surely the people are clear about that, but probably the Green supporters aren't. But, no, I get that. Um, you know, 
We're talking about tens of millions of people. Why do we even have an election system in this country? It's like a public opinion poll for the system to see what they can get away with. So we have to organize a large enough constituency in there to make a difference. That involves putting all the issues together. It means putting the class issues forefront. That so many of the identity issues which are so important and which have pulled on people's heartstrings but they have not yet fully formed a, a combined progressive movement that puts all the issues together that can really contend. So we have to put that program together, and then we have to have a political instrument to carry out that program. Now my favoring is to build a faction or a group within the Democratic Party to do that, because I don't think because of the two-party system, you can't do it as a third party in the United States. It has to be a win within the Democratic Party. So that's where this, this uh, referendum campaign comes in. We actually have something called a Congressional Progressive Caucus in Congress. It voted for something called the Budget for All, with like 82 votes and 72 votes or something. You know, not enough to win, but enough to be a, a meaningful equation. So this is our program, and this is the skeleton of the program of the new party. But it has to be built, it's going to take decades, and it has to be built within the political process. We have a non-binding referendum in Massachusetts as one reflection of that. But as far as social movements, that's what pulls on the heartstrings. That's what really develops the issues and develops people's passion. You know, for me, the quintessential social movement of, the, of our lifetime has been the gay liberation movement. Look at that. You know, from a completely marginalized people, you now have the President of the United States embracing gay marriage in, in what, 40 years. That's a social movement. That's a successful, powerful social movement. Did it ignore electoral politics? Absolutely not. But was it reduced to that, or was it its main thing? Absolutely not. It was more about celebration and cultural and all of, you know, and all of that. And then, yeah, you pull the lever too. But how do we build those coalitions? That's the problem. What is the platform to struggle for power of the progressive people? I was going to say, and I'm going to steal a quote from, uh, and from someone, and he knows who he is, is that Obama is not the lesser evil, he's the more effective evil at demobilizing dissent and critical thinking. The type of stuff that George W. Bush did with renditions, with wars, with homeland security, so many progressive, in scare quotes, and Democrats are silent now. And the truth is, um, and Seren did touch on this briefly, and I just want to remember, I was inspired by the Arab Spring, and I do remember seeing a picture of a protester holding a tear canister that said, Made in the USA in Tahrir Square. That tear canister came from the Obama administration. The Obama administration has been engaged in wars that, that anti-war activists have funneled their energy into this party. The peace activists, labor activists, it, I, someone said, once said that the Democrat Party, and I believe it's rightfully said, is the graveyard of social movements. Whether it's the labor movement, the peace movement, the environmental movement, you're sucked into a party that ultimately supports inequality and oppression, that ultimately enforces imperialist rule around the world. And I don't think that we should, the precious energies of Occupy, in my mind, have not been to mobilize the base for the Democratic Party or to engage in electoral participation, but have actually engaged in the questioning of the system's very legitimacy, the system being capitalism, and the push, hopefully, to get beyond that. Now, does that mean that there is no place for electoral politics? I would say not at this time. I would, I would not urge any participation. I would hopefully build a third party that is engaged in something, a positive transformation that moves us beyond capitalism to a socialist system, and that is those are just my comments on the matter. Um, I uh, largely agree with you um, on the balance sheet of uh, the current Democratic administration and the last Republican administration. Uh, I think it's pretty much even Steve and myself. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we live in a, a one-party state. I think that it's controlled. Uh, there's, there's, there's people who just participate in one party, rich people. There's people, rich people who participate in the other party. There's a lot of rich people who participate and fund both parties. Um, 
both parties represent the multinational corporate elite. Uh, the, uh, the wonderful accomplishment, uh, well, it's not really so wonderful. It's mainly a lot of money for the insurance companies, that's why they back right. it. Uh, but at any rate, it does, it does cover some more people, but it's not in a survivable way. It's not a, economically, this health care reform is not a long-term survivable health care reform. It's not even clear that it points in the direction of a survivable single-payer system. Uh, but uh, when you weigh, uh, we live, there's only one society, it's a global society. And when you weigh the entire society, which is what you have to do, when you're weighing Bush versus Obama or whatever, uh, I'm not sure you can score any points for the Democratic administration. And I think it's worthy of mention also that, uh, you know, the Bush administration passed the Patriot Act, but it was the Obama administration. Uh, that made it uh, legal to kill any American citizen anywhere in the world without ever pressing any charges, presenting any evidence, uh, and to indefinitely turn them over to the army for detention for the rest of their life. Um, not too progressive. Uh, I, I, th I think that uh, uh, we, need to, we need to work more at third-party politics and figure out how to do it, uh, because I personally don't think we I think we'll have a better chance working that way than we will working within the Democratic Party because I think the forces are so great that control both parties very effectively. I think we'd be better off, and, and no one has mentioned this, you know, we need to educate people and struggle, struggle toward a political system of representative democracy, a proportional representation. We will never win anything ultimately electorally unless we manage to get a proportional representation system. At least then, when you get 20% of the votes, you have control over political resources in, in a way to make your presence felt and effective in people's lives. In that sense, the European system is better than our system, and it offers much more hope for effective social movement uh, involvement in, in uh, the political process. and. Uh, much more hope for uh, effective gains uh, politically. You know, I think one problem is we really restricted the conversation around electoral politics to like the upcoming elections, <laughs> uh, which, which is obviously excusable, but uh, it leaves out a lot. Um, the referendum idea is an interesting idea because it helps us cut yeah. across uh, yeah. political parties yeah. and, and at the same time gain experience in running, um, in engaging the public and running campaigns. Yeah, that's a very right. Thing. And yeah. if we look at it historically, it's been interesting, where the Communist Party did not prevail in Italy in the 1970s, divorce and other kinds of social issues uh, were won through the right to divorce through referendums, right? Yes. And, and Lula got his start in 1985, right, the Workers' Party, by becoming the party that demanded direct elections for, for the presidency in Brazil. So I think it is possible for us to gain uh, experience in running elections and, and uh, participating, even when we're faced with the choice between evil and more effective evils. <laughs> and so, so I think that we can do that um, through, the, um, through the referendum process. We yeah, have a chance yeah. now here in Massachusetts to do it. And that's the thing that Cole passed around, that green sheet of paper a nice unifying agenda that, that will bring in a lot of folks. So, mm -hmm. so I think there, there are ways to do it. One other problem that I, I, I encounter when we talk with people about elections, especially when you talk with unions about it, they'll put all their money into elections but not know how to support without squelching the social movements. And so I think that uh, we, we need to think about how social movements can be invested in to be more efficacious in their, in their work. I, I have um, one comment, uh, one question and a comment. The question, I don't know that much about, it's the Working People's Party, I think the party the, that runs their own in local elections, very progressive, but working then in the Working Families Party. Mm -hmm. But then in, um, like, for the presidency, you could vote for Obama, but on their line. So 
that's called cute. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know why that hasn't taken off more because it seems a simple way where you could get a lot of people who would mm -hmm. say support Obama but who are more progressive, to, you know, and you could begin then to build higher and higher into the chain. At any rate, that, that's sort of a question. The comment that I, I don't know how to make, um, I mean, without a lot of uh, assumptions being made about what I'm saying, etc. But I think we cannot ignore the enormous impact of having a black president. Um, I was not disillusioned. I worked for Obama the first time I ever worked on any, you know, campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't disillusioned because I knew, you know, <laughs> that he would be like a Clinton, etc. But uh -huh. Uh -huh. that it really does matter. Racism has yeah. split this country apart, you know, from the beginning. And to not figure out in our social movements how to use that little opening that some white people voted for a black president, et cetera, that the Tea Party is fueled by racism and you know, and, and how to use that to get more people voting, more poor people uh -huh. of color who aren't voting, et cetera, um, on referendums like this, et cetera. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. to, to not I'm, I agree, I agree, I guess the final comment, what you said, Sorensen, but I think we can't just like ignore that fact. That's not like a little fact that is a big, big thing in this country. Um, I think it might be uh, confusing somewhat in our discussions about electoral politics to talk about having two parties, because I think it, it's we have one party. Like when you're in your in your when you're in a nation that has multi party uh, this multi party state, and you listen to the Labour Party and the socialist candidates and the Christian Democrats, they really sound different. They've got different priorities. But the Republicans and the Democrats, they both work for Wall Street. They protect privilege. But there's like social differences. Like, like Republicans tend to be homophobic. But there's the log cabin club and things like that. So I, I the, the thing about talking about, I'm just getting confused in this thing right now about what we're talking about when we're talking about the Democrats and the Republicans because I think we have <laughs> the state capitalist party. So there's the single party, and then it has, in terms of its social agendas, there's a left wing and a right wing, uh, but it, it doesn't seem to have much explanatory power to be talking about the uh, which party to vote for because there's just the one party. But it, it would be great if we could open up and have a second party or a third party. <laughs> that would be good. But the, I, I'm just getting confused comparing those two. I, I feel like that strategically, in terms of casting a vote, I think. What people do sometimes strategically is they figure out what they might be doing there that would give them more time to work on building a, a movement. Mm -hmm. And if, for example, Mitt Romney came in and was able to make a couple of Supreme Court justice appointments so that they overturned Roe v. Wade, people like me would be spending a lot of time working on the shitstorm that would happen when they overturned Roe v. Wade. But if we elect Obama, then I'm going to be working about Palestinian rights, which are going to be deteriorating because of his staunch support for Israel. Uh, I mean, you just pick which of those things uh, uh, might strategically cause less uh, drain on the ability to build a movement. Uh, but I think that looking at what works, uh, the, what person mentioned earlier about the gay rights movement, I think that that was an amazing process because it involved direct action. There was like not just act up, but there was Queer Nation. Some of you guys remember the people involved in that sort of stuff. There's radical street political stuff. There was, at the same time, there were like electoral agendas, things that were motivating campaigns and electoral politics, Democratic Party, that sort of thing. Um, and then there was also the Log Cabin Club and people on the Republican Party, the other, the other wing of the same party. But I think Bill McKibben has been doing something similarly effective in terms of getting mobilizing lots of people with this thing that's an environmental thing. And it's, it's really having a vision, a picture of like the world that people want to live in that uh, transcends those single party and lets people sort of get around which of those single candidates. Because individual candidates don't really change the overall direction of the policy of the single party. Uh, but I think it's a good thing that social movements can do, like Occupy, is to try to stitch together the work that are, are being done by people like City Life, Vida Urbana, Bill McKibben, uh, 
those kinds of things that are that are they're not really about a, a party; they're about a, a vision. Uh, and culture has a lot to do with that. Like, uh, musicians, like I think it might be, yeah. I think those uh, focusing on culture and on things that build world visions uh, that aren't focused on this side view, of, like whether we have uh, about the difference between the two parties, it, I think we might be instrumental. Um, so I hear Dana, and I, I do hear you. I, I get a little worried though, as I hear you know, there's not two parties; there's just one party. And I, I want to bring that back down to local politics. <laughs> and in your local politics, it's not as easy to say that because in our local politics, we do, you know, elect um, the socialists and we do elect um, different parties. And so I get a little worried though because we always look at it as this national, you know, presidential election, and and we don't get as concerned with the local politics and what effects we can have in our local politics and what effect social movements, how much more effect social movements can have within the local sphere than on this national level where it's just two political parties that are the same thing being supported by Wall Street. You can't say the same thing to two you know, city councilmen who are, are, are banging heads up against each other for a race and what that means to the people who live in that district for them really. There is a big difference for them between those two parties. Um, so I just, I want us to all be careful about that and be very aware that we can't just all direct this towards, you know, um, this huge political thing that's going to happen, you know, coming up, that there are local elections and those are so important and there are more, there's more than one party when it comes to that. So. Well, I, I actually have so many thoughts going yeah, uh, from one direction to another as the conversations evolve here. But I, I think it's, it's very important to acknowledge that going back to the original point, uh, what social movements actually do for us, regardless be it through a politics, uh, voting route or not, um, is the fact that at least Occupy removes some of the cynicism that we were facing for a long, long time. And talking about these issues that now seems to be so open and so old at the same time, was very hard to just talk with a neighbor, with the, even somebody in the, in the subway or in the bus. And that now is the opportunity. So social movement has a potential. But what is next? And that's when we try to bounce the question back to you all, because we see, as, as we were uh, listening, that we top it in the Arab Spring the leadership. But we top it. We didn't change the system. We didn't make any difference. It's going to be uh, like I go and vote and feel good. You remember all the pink, uh, purple fingers in Iraq and uh, mm -hmm. Afghanistan and all that. And everybody felt great. But it didn't really translate in any permanent change. So then that is the question. We have now all this road to the electoral. And achieving power, yes, is important and fundamental for us workers to actually be able to change anything in our life permanently. But also, it's, it's very easy and hard to understand also how political parties actually are conformed and how function. I participated last presidential election with the McKinney campaign, and believe me, it was, it, it was very exciting because all the proposals, all the, all the exciting work, all the different people that got to talk to, but it's so much work bureaucratically, and, and shouldn't be like that. And that is another thing that if we don't exercise our democracy as a participatory and just vocalize all these questions, it's not going to go anywhere. We're going to have, as somebody said earlier, mm -hmm. having this conversation over and over and cycle So what is the next stage? Now that we remove some of that cynicism, what we should do? What, what is our next step? And I guess it's to us as I can do answer it, but I would like to throw that back to you guys. Just to go back to the original conversation. I think the road to answer from Occupy is what is the next step? I mean, because it is it isn't something that comes from a leadership down, but a, a thing that's brought back to the group as to where do we want to go? Hey, can I say something? I think to the extent that I was um, inspired by Occupy, I mean, it's it's this this collaborative process. I don't know what the next step. And I think a lot of us are afraid to admit that. And more and more I don't know. And I think that's the place to start. It's perspective. 
Are the two parties the same? Are they one? We, we, I don't want to doubt. We've been having this conversation a, a, a long time, but it's. Are you looking at the micro or the macro? From really far away, of course it's the same party, but the closer you get, wow, there's a lot of differences. Those small differences actually affect people. Yeah. So it depends on where do you want to look? And then how can we start our conversation based on that kind of thinking? Um, so I don't know what the answer is, but I'd be really interested to sort of start figuring out new kinds of solutions. In the mid green. Sure. Can you yes. Uh, one. I think we are getting at the point that things are becoming more interesting and more solid. Um, I have been very much impressed by the uh, Occupy movement because for the first time in this country since I have been here 40 years, for the first time, I've seen people from different walks of life getting together and being <coughs> able to express their concerns. Now, that is just a tiny step, a tiny, tiny step, but very important. I think it's critical. On the other hand, I've heard, I have been very impressed by a statement from several organizations. A better world is possible. That sounds very abstract, but it's not. Because now that you are together and you are expressing their concerns, I think the next step is try to understand what causes your concern, your concern, your concern, your concerns. If you are able to understand that the causes of all these different kinds of concerns is the system, then I think you, in my opinion, you are doing something more solid. So you need to, dis to define or to decide you want to change the system or you want to improve the system. If you want to improve the system, it doesn't matter. Go with the Republicans or go to the Democrats. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> but if you want to change the system, you need to work outside of the system, as the, uh, the compañero suggested. So that is my, my comment. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken? Uh, someone Please. Yes, I, I was uh, happy to hear you mention the local, because that was the first thought that came to mind as we were talking the last comment before. And I do think we are such a long way in this country from forming any kind of ability to form any kind of major program. We have a hard time. It's better than it was in terms of the left and progressive movement working together. But we still have a long way to go. I think there's a lot of developments. You spoke about the Cleveland example, the Cleveland model. There are a number of different movements and attempts you know, to start doing the things for ourselves. I don't think they are adequate yet, but they are models that are very important. And we were also very inspired by Wisconsin, what went on in Wisconsin with the labor activists and, you know, just camping out of the Capitol. I mean, I think we have to just continue to be very open and to embrace and take on uh, these different models and realize this is going to evolve. I personally do feel it is important to continue to work on certain campaigns. I'm actually not a central person, but I'm working on the Elizabeth Warren campaign because I feel that it gives me an opportunity to talk with people about some of the issues mm. that Occupy raised, and she doesn't go far enough, and there's a lot of things that I don't agree with. But I think we've got to work with what we have. We could just, and I do think the local gives us a lot more opportunity. In terms of the 
can have more than two parties in this country, I think it's going to have to come up from the local, the regional, the state, whatever, up. Because then you'll have enough of a base, enough of a program that each of these parties has developed and can then cohere. I don't believe we can do it national and down unless there's some enormous change coming up that we are not of us anticipating. So I appreciate that. Uh, some of these things we were talking about are based on local experiences, and we should make note of those. Do you have any, any last words of wisdom? No. Okay. I'll say two, things, two quick things. Um, <clears throat> My uh, my sister was born in Houston, Texas, so I, and I have relatives in Texas, and so I visited those relatives, and I've noticed that I'm a lot more comfortable walking around Boston than I am walking around Houston, and I think that has something to do with this being a Democrat state versus that being a, a Republican state. Now it's possible that may be because I'm a man of color, so my experience is unique, but. A lot of my white friends that I've talked to have also pointed out they have had a similar experience. So I don't think it's just that. So I think there is a big difference, at least in my lived experience, uh, which I think is important. Uh, that doesn't mean I think you should vote for the Democrats. I think the Greens, great, or an alternative party. I just think don't ignore the electoral. That, that would be my, my first point. The second point is uh, the first person in the US to bring up the issue of women getting the vote if you mark that period when that first person said women should get the vote to when they actually got the vote, it took about a hundred years. And I think activism often we have to we have to maybe think in those terms that we're in it for the long haul and we can afford therefore uh, Jeff made some nice points and I think all the speakers made some points on this. We can afford to be experimental without necessarily neglecting what has worked in the past. So I'll end with that. Well, thanks. Thanks to you all. Thanks to everyone for coming. And I'm sure there's, there'll be time for further conversation, yeah. but I think this is a nice, nice place to end. Thank you very much.